something. Okay, well, we're just carrying back on where we left off. We left off a few weeks ago for one reason or another. We haven't done it for a few weeks, but carrying on. In chapter seven of the Song of Songs, we got up to the end of verse four, the nose. And as we said at the start of this passage, this is another great description, isn't it, of the returning Shulamite and a description that started off with a feet, wasn't it? And it's gone working all the way up now. And so now we have reached the head, because we're in verse five. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Mount, you probably notice, is in italics because it's not in the text, it's not in the Hebrew ha mount. It just says, Your head crowns you like Carmel, and the hair of your head is like purple, and a king is held captive by your tresses. So that's the first verse that we want to take on tonight. And it's a complex passage, this, and it gets more and more complex, I would say, even to the point again of uh, dispute, if that's the right way, not dispute, but, you know, disagreements over who's speaking. Some of these times, it gets a little bit complex later when some commentators say one thing, some say another. My Bible says one thing. My translation says, well, the King James has another version. And so it is quite hard to see on the face of it as we get into it. Who is doing the speaking? But this is still claiming to be the moment speaking to the Shulamite, saying, your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. And even that is debatable, the meaning of this. You know, we'll go with it, that it's Carmel. It's Mount Carmel, the, you know, the famous mount of Elijah and Solo, which is a, an impressive mountain, you know, in the air, uh, right next to the Mediterranean, and it just rises out of the sea, and it is an impressive mountain to look at. So that's one area that we can have a look at, but there's just a debate issue is that this is also a word for Carmel, which in, it's like a Persian word, which some of the commentators say has been used, and it fits with purple, because it means purple, the same meaning. It's like saying your head's like purple, which he says also later on. So that's how they see it. And then that purple is because Mount Carmel itself was where apparently they got the little sea creatures from, where they made the purple die from. And so is that what is is that what is is that what is getting said? I don't know. There's, there's a strong views on either side of it, so I think it's not going to do any harm to just have a little look at it you know, always. Because Mount Carmel, Carmel means garden land in the Blue Letter Bible. If you look up Carmel, it just says, you know, garden land in, in, in italics is, is in, in, in quotes, is what it means. So it fits with the whole description, doesn't it, of what the beloved loves, the garden language, or the fruitfulness. It's a lush mountain with many trees and plants that grow on it abundantly. So there's that side of it. Um, I was just struck by it today as I'm reading it, though, with the, the language of the crown and the reference to purple. And that's exactly what you saw today, the you? You saw the procession of, of the Queen going from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey. And the procession was with a coffin. And on top of it, there was a purple pillow. And on top of that, there was a purple crown. And it's definitely a royalty reference, isn't it? Your head crowns you. You know, we're speaking to a member of the royal family, as we are, are we? Believers and members of the royal family. So it fits with that, doesn't it? To speak in that way to a member of, the, of a royalty like this, that your head crowns you. You know, like, well, Carmel, fruitfulness, etc., or... This other way of looking at it, which is to do with these um, sea creatures that were taken out of the sea right next to Mount Carmel, apparently. And, um, and that's what we're saying, that it was, it was arranged like, like a hair in the shape of a shell, like a sea, like a like, it, like it's a creature from the sea, you know, with a shell on it, which is apparently where this purple dye was, was made from. But I just want to talk about 
couple of the crown scriptures which are encouraging scriptures for us because you know our faith is connected with crown so it's a wonderful thing I got sent a lovely uh, WhatsApp about the Queen and apparently she had said in a lifetime to one of the chaplains or something that I really hope Jesus comes back, my Lord comes back in my lifetime and he asked her why and she went all giddy and emotional etc and said I just want to lay my crown at his feet, which is a wonderful thing for a queen to say, is a real member of the royal family, understood, I've got a crown, it's like a coffin now, but you know, she wants to lay her crown at his feet, it is a faith, mm. part of our faith, is it, crowns, so here's a couple of crown scriptures, just ones we all know, from 2 Timothy, here's the first one, 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1, through Eight. So I won't read the first part of it because it's a famous passage, Second Timothy chapter four, about the end times, isn't it? But in context of that, he's saying in verse uh, seven, "I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, will give to me on that day." And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, amen. You know, that's what we really ought to be about. That's why we're doing this song. It's what we, why we do a lot of what we do. Because we want to keep in that real faith, don't we? Of loving his appearing. Knowing he is coming again. He is not going to leave us. He is going to come again. So is this all connected? Why is she is this crown? is? connected with someone who loves his appearing, who wants him back, who wants to be with him. You know, that's crown language. So any of the crown scriptures, I think, you know, we can, we can look at and be encouraged by them, can't we? That, that's for us, Paul saying, it's not just for me, this mighty apostle, it's for everyone. <laughs> Everyone's a crown of righteousness for everyone who loves his appearing. You know, they're probably the crowns that we get in cast, etc. By the elders, anyway. So, anyway, Second Thessalonians are up and chapter 2, verse 19. Um, so, yeah, just a quick one. For what is our hope or our joy or crown of rejoicing? It is, is it not even you in the presence? Here it is again of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, at his coming. For you are our glory and joy. It's a lovely way of looking at things, isn't it? The crown is one another, one another. And then finally, I've got one more, and it would be First Peter chapter five, the crown scriptures. First Peter chapter five, verse, verse four. And when, say it is again, the chief shepherd appears, what a title. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So again, it's connected, isn't it? Every one of them scriptures has something to do with the Lord's coming, his appearing, his, his coming again. It's connected with crowns being given out for rewards, faithfulness, all the rest of it. So... That's what I'm seeing when I see your head crowns, you like Carmel. You know, it's got something to do with this, has it? This reward for the faith, for the faithful, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Carmel. Can I mention yeah, that? why? I mean, you might have it in your notes, but when the, the crown of thorns is put on your oh, shiver, you... he had a purple robe put on him as well. Right. At that point. So well, I'm just wondering whether. You know, and it says they bowed before him then, didn't they? And say, all oh, hail the king. So, you know, I don't know whether that would have anything to do with it, but there was a crown of thorns. Well, that's great. Yeah. I have got that reference in John, so we'll come to that in a, in a, in a, in a minute. Sorry, I no, it's fine. It's fine. Great, great comments. Um, so, um, anything else? Say? No. no. Uh, 
And we just stop on I've got a little left this is a quick look at it. Isaiah 35, it's in the notes, so I'll just go there and check it out. Isaiah 30, oh yeah, it's another wonderful uh, and obviously Isaiah 35 is that wonderful messianic future glory of Zion passage. Uh, when it says that the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing, the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. So again, it's just Carmel is related to what it says, the excellence, the fruitfulness, the messianic kingdom references at this you know it's all pointing to that you know uh, from one of the commentators is like carmel matthew Poole, is saying that it's eminent and pleasant to the eye fruitful as carmel was which may note that her mind talking of this area was adorned and replenished with knowledge and other excellent gifts of the holy ghost amen ah, it's that beautiful Mind set on the Messiah, isn't it? Setting your mind on things above, you know, references to mountains. But as you've said, they also going on, it says, uh, so your, your, the hair of your head is like purple. A king is held captive by your tresses. Beautiful language, isn't it? The king held captive. I think we mentioned this on Saturday. Sabbath meeting about the beautiful captive. You know, when you go off to war, you see a beautiful captive, you want to bring her, make your wife, etc. So it's that captivated, isn't it? Mm. That the Lord is captivated by his people. Mm. But there's more to say about that because there's being held captive is held, it doesn't really say captive, but it is fair because it's the word that's used of Joseph when he was bound in the dungeon. Genesis 39, verse 20. So it is that prisoner kind of context. Also, you see the word for this asar to be bound, held captive, is used a lot in a chapter we looked at recently in Numbers chapter 30, when it was saying if anyone makes a vow, and it was men making vows or women making vows, but in Hebrew it was that if someone binds their soul, if someone binds their soul, to make a vow to God, you know, you bind in your soul. It's the same word, so you can see how it's connected with being bound, taken prisoner, mm -hmm. swearing an oath, all of this. And that's what it's, the effect is to the king, saying a king is bound, held by your tresses. And that's mm -hmm. interesting language again, because... Um, Tresses or galleries, it might say in the King James. We saw it in the very start of this song, in chapter 1, verse 17. We saw this word for tresses. And there it was translated as the beams of our house, our cedar, and our rafters of fear. So it's got that, you know, that abode, as the, that place of dwelling going on. And this is... Um, what Gil is saying, probably my favourite of all the commentators on this book anyway. The king is held in the galleries, the same with the head of the church, the king of Zion, the king of saints, whose kingdom is a spiritual and everlasting one. And by the galleries in which he is held, maybe meant the ordinances of the gospel, where Christ and his people walk and converse together, where he discloses the secrets of his heart to them, leads them into a further acquaintance with his covenant and the blessings and promises of it, and from whence they have delightful views of his person and fullness. See the king in his beauty and behold the good land which is afar off. Mm -hmm. Christ takes delight in the assemblies and in the ordinances of his people and admires the fruits of his grace in them. When applied to the church and to each faithful Christian, all this denotes that beauty of holiness in which they shall be presented to their heavenly bridegroom. It's just wonderful language, isn't it? About people that are in his word, walking in his ways. He beholds it. It captivates him to see his people walking and keeping his ways. Because that's how you love him, don't you? 
And if you love me, obey me. Keep me words, keep me commands. And so that's how these commentators see it. It's all to do with, you know, Matthew Poo agrees, the galleries may note the ordinances or rather the churches in which Christ walks. You know, like you see in Revelation 2, he walks about the assemblies, doesn't he? Walks amongst the lampstands, etc. So in which Christ and believers converse together. So pretty consistent. That, that's how they see this. It's, it's the king seeing his people walking together in unity, in love, in obedience. And I, as you've already said, I don't know when I go with that completely, the whole purple connection is, we've well, we already said it's a royal connection, we've seen it today, you know, absolutely right in front of it, the queen, purple. But it's undoubted from John chapter 19, so that, that's where it comes from, that when, when Pilate brings Yeshua out and he brings him out in purple, doesn't he? he says, behold the man, you know, and then, He's charged with being a king, being king of the Jews, etc. So it's definitely a royalty colour, but as we have also said, it's definitely a priestly colour as well, isn't it? Because we've seen that lots in the whole tabernacle and priestly garments in Exodus, all of that, chapter 25, right the way through, the instructions for the tabernacle and all of what the priests had to wear, and purple was significant there, wasn't it? So you can see it's a priestly colour and it's a kingly colour. And every time we mention priests and kings in the same breath, we understand only what we're really part of here, which is a royal priesthood. Now we're part of a royal priesthood, kings or a kingdom of priests. So all of this language is that in most what he's saying. Your head's like caramel, your hair is like purple, and the king just loves it when he sees his people walking and operating as a royal priesthood. When you understand we're part of the royal family, when you understand our role, I, I am praying that now, you know, as in, as in the natural, we are seeing a, a man who was born to be king, ascending to the throne, receiving his inheritance. That's what he's actually saying, isn't he? You know, this inheritance has fallen upon me, etc. The king, Charles III. Well, you know, I just pray that the people of Yeshua, the Messiah, will understand the same, understand that we are born again. We're born again to be royalty, born again to be a royal priesthood. I pray that that understanding will come more and more to his people now, that we will ascend in this way, rightfully to the place where we ought to know where we are, seated in heavenly places. Mm-hmm. That's the understanding that we need, isn't it? Know this, set your mind on things above, where the Messiah is seated, we're seated in him. So with all of what's going on in the natural, I really pray it will have an effect to our prayers on us as believers, that we can understand this, because that's what we are seeing here, a royal picture. Yeah? Anybody say anything about what we want to Because that's all I'm going to say on that. You know what I mean? And then he says, uh, chapter 7, um, how fair and pleasant you are. So we've sort of gone now from feet, right through us and all the way up the body, finishing off with the head, the crown, hair. Now, a summary statement maybe, how fair and how pleasant you are, oh love, with your delights. And it's just some great stuff in the words, you know, just the actual words that are in. How fair and pleasant you are, and I like this because, you know, it's obviously the bridegroom, the male, speaking to the female part. But, you know, this word for how pleasant you are is, is used between men, which, you know, the bride of the Messiah is, is made up of men and women, isn't it? So we can also, men can use this word, see how this word's used. Yeah, it's in Second Samuel. Obviously, it's a famous one, it's a famous passage, but I just thought it's not often used this way. The words in Hebrew, na em, pleasant, na em, like Naomi, where you get Naomi from. But, you know, I just thought, let's have a look at where it's used in Second Samuel, chapter 1, verse 26. 
because you know it is very masculine to feminine this this discourse isn't it this conversation but he loves us men in the same way doesn't he and you get a glimpse of that in second chapter samuel chapter one verse Have I got that right? Verse 26. Yeah. David and Jonathan, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women, which is great, isn't it, for us men mm -hmm. to understand. You know, he loves us. You know, he expresses it in this way to a, to a, to a bride or, you know, etc. But there's a love that he has for men which surpasses that for women, you know, in that way. So that's just, you know, lovely. And I've put, I've put Proverbs in as well, because that stood out to me, Proverbs chapter two, this word. It's like word studies. You get a lot out of just the word studies and the connections. And again, Solomon is the author of Proverbs. So there's always good interplay, I think, between Solomon and Proverbs. And Ecclesiastes, as it goes, which I'm studying today in my Hebrew lesson, and within Ecclesiastes, and I was reading and going, Wow, that way to the Song of Songs, when they're only words that are only pop up now and again. So they're always worth looking at. But this is what is a good words of instruction. Probably in chapter 2, verse 10, when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil, etc. But the point is, this uh, knowledge is pleasant to your soul. So when he's saying where it's like how fair and pleasant you are, you know, that's because of these qualities. She's got wisdom has entered the heart. Knowledge is pleasant to her soul. She's got a pleasant soul because of the effect of wisdom and the effect of godly knowledge, etc. So how fair and pleasant you are, O oh love, with your delights. And that's another great way, delights. You know, there's a great psalm, Psalm 37, verse 4, a famous one. Delight yourself, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And what a promise. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And you should be thinking of a scripture that goes along with this, one that we read regular. Isaiah 58. 58, that's right. Isaiah 58. Well, let's have a look at it. It's this word, delight, anag. You know, when, when Hebrews have a, a meal together, like when we have a meal, we, and then we have a meal, you know, the Hebrews will call that an oneg, an oneg, like a buffy, but it's to do with it being a delightful time, delightful food, delightful fellowship, an oneg, delightful, anag is the word. And we read this often here in Isaiah 58. The reason we read it often here is because it's a Sabbath scripture. It just is, it's a Sabbath scripture. And in Isaiah 58, it's a great scripture. It's a great chapter, isn't it? You know, when we read the whole chapter, it's full of Amazing promises, isn't it? Of if you will, if you'll do this and the blessings that will come. And it sort of finishes off in chapter 58, verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, which means stop desecrating it, stop trampling upon it, even from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, Honourable and shall honour him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Now, there it is. If, 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 then, you know how many times have you seen that in the story? Deuteronomy, if, then, if, then, if you'll do this with regard to the Sabbath, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken, you know, and that's just a brilliant, practical thing, isn't it? Do these things, and then 
the law says, then you'll then you learn, you'll, you'll delight yourself in me. And we've seen that Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Not, not the selfish desires of your selfish heart, but I believe he'll put the desires in your heart that he wants you to have. And the creator us godly desires, deliver us from trivial pursuits and put us on to holy, eternal pursuits. Deliver us from vanity, vanity, as we believe in Ecclesiastes, and give us satisfaction. You know, when we know, amen. I'm walking in your ways. I know this is going to count for something, Lord. You know, I want to delight myself in you. Well, there's probably other things we could look at, but that's just a great scripture, isn't it, from Isaiah 58. If you'll do these things, then you will delight yourself. And I think we can testify to the practical side of that army that we do get a lot of joy and uh, fullness out of doing these things so that's that on that thing just one more on this word delightful because it is a delightful word and it just summarizes what is being said here to this shulamite who has come back into the ways of the Lord, etc. Starting to love him again, return to her first love. I think that's the best way to describe this scenario. She has returned to her first love. As I she return, return. Remember that's where we are in chapter six. How could you what could you see in me? And then this is the answer to all of that, wasn't it? And Jeremiah chapter six, verse two. I have likened the daughter of Zion. To a lovely and delightful, delicate, it says in my but I know it's the way it's translated there, delightful woman. So that's what's getting said. The daughter of Zion is this fair and pleasant with your delights, you know, amen. So that's what we all aspire to be by his grace, we will be. Amen. Guilt, just finished off that section with guilt. She was all delighted. Her words, her actions and gestures, her comely countenance, her sweet and pleasant voice in prayer and praise, her ravishing looks of faith and love, her heaven, heavenly ears and evangelic walk, in all which she appeared beautiful and delightful, beyond all human thought and expression. Amen. You know, I'm really, I've got a lot more out of reading these commentators. You know, things I just, you know, I just was passing by that got over my head, but it's stopped me and made me just look at it a bit deeper and go, okay. And all of this is for what we always keep saying, isn't it? That it'll have this effect on us, that it will put a mirror before us to make us see how we are, how he sees us, how we need to be. But really, from a new creation point of view, how he has made us, you know, this is how he sees us anyway. Or how we should conduct ourselves. So that's that. Then the next part is really interesting, I think. My quite hard to example. Just overall, my first impression of this, you know, eight years ago, whatever it was, when I started to love this song. When I first read this, my overall impression was it's a miracle going on. There's a miracle taking place here. And we alluded to this last time we spoke when he was talking about her breasts back in chapter 7, verse 3. And we said then, didn't we, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. And was that an allusion to the perfect fawns and everything? But they are immature and they need to grow. And we said that then as a, a suggestion. And I said, when we get to chapter eight, we'll see that that is certainly the outlook of the brothers. Their brothers are saying she's got no breasts. And she says, hang on a minute. I have, they're like towns. So we can see this, this allusion to, you know, the, the size, the fullness of them, etc. And so now we're back to the breasts again in a minute, because that's what he's going to say now. This stature of yours is like a palm tree. And that's, just, you know, we'll talk about this for a while. But this stature of yours is like a palm tree, and your breasts like its clusters. So straight away you're thinking, well, what's that? A palm tree. And you know, as you do meditate on these things and just start to consider the palm tree, it is just a wonderful tree, isn't it? You know, when you see them tropical storms, 
and the palm sees a better sober, but when it's sober, it's just back again. And that's a great picture of the palm sea, the stature of yours. It's it's it's, it's just unshakable. You know, the, the, the storms can't can't destroy you. You know, it might blow a few leaves off here and there, but pruning here and there, maybe. You know, as some of the commentators are saying, you know, persecution arises and this is how we use things to prune us. And endurance. Endurance. Well, that palm is definitely an enduring tree, isn't it? It stands in the mm-hmm. test, it faces up, doesn't it? And, you know, it's a, obviously very supple, you know what I mean? But upright and erect. And then we look at them scriptures. But this statue of yours, so Ephesians 4, just to see that like that word used in the New Testament and give us an idea of just pattern out of it really. Ephesians chapter 4, great passage when he's talking about the gifts that he's given for the equipment of the saints in verse 12. All of these gifts that the Lord, when he ascended, we read that one the Sabbath as well, he led captivity captive when he ascended. He gave gifts to men for the equipping, verse 12, of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. <laughs> that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro <laughs> and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See, it's that. Palm tree, it's like that doesn't break in that, you know, it doesn't give in to that. And that's why things get said here. This statue of yours is like a palm tree. Mm-hmm. And you can see in the New Testament that that's the goal of all this, isn't it? That we will grow up and mature and become the perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Wow. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies and so on. So that's a good start into this, what's being said, isn't it? This palm tree. And your breasts, like its clusters. Well, let's just have a little bit more palm tree. This is another one we read every week, actually. No, we read this every week. This uh, very, very, I can't remember when we haven't read this one. Mm-hmm. Because it's a Sabbath psalm, isn't it? And we read it. And it's a great one, Psalm 92. But again, just another clear reference to the palm tree and what it, what it indicates, what's being said. when uh, He's saying this statue of yours is like the palm tree. Well, in Psalm 92, verse 12, the righteous, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a seed in a leaven. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. And well, we need to talk, but it's brilliant, isn't it? They will still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare. This is what we're here to do. Declare that the Lord, Yahovah, he was, who is, and who is to come. He's upright. I mean, this is like a palm tree, isn't it? It's an upright tree. Grows long and tall and upright. And to clear that he is upright, he is my rock, and there's no unrighteousness in him. So clearly, palm trees connected with the righteous, righteous people are classed as being palm trees. You know, and palm trees are all year round trees, aren't they? They are evergreen in that way, you know, that, like it's saying here, always fresh and flourishing and bearing fruit. Amen. Mm-hmm. So that's a great palm tree scripture. And the palm tree itself does feature probably maybe more than we think in scripture, but it really is there. In, it's in the Leviticus 23 commandments, uh, Leviticus 23 verse 40, for celebrating tabernacles, support, you have to get well, you know, in that covenant, the old covenants for Israel, they had to get the leaves of palm trees. And then we see the palm tree leaves appear in the Gospels, don't we? At mm-hmm. Passover, and Yeshua is entered into Jerusalem, and all the palm trees, the leaves, well, the leaves of the palm trees are put out. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. And then we see them in Revelation, 
even in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, the way from the palm branches. So the palm is so associated with the kingdom. It's a king, kingdom tree. And so that's what's being said. This statue of yours, it's very upright, very enduring, very fruitful, very reliable. Brilliant tree. And so now to go to its breast, like its clusters. So obviously the, the clusters of the palm tree are dates, aren't they? Dates, dates, gold, brown, you know, gorgeous. You know, when you think, you know, especially in a desert environment, and you've got this big, tall tree, gorgeous, big uh, green leaves on its branches, and then beautiful golden brown dates, which produce honey. You know, date honey. So that's definitely what the clusters are. I mean, I think the King James says your breasts like it's clusters of grapes, but the grapes is just in italics because yeah. the palm tree is, is, is dates, isn't it? But why I always thought this is a miracle is because of this next verse or the next part of the verse. And he's saying, let's get me. Song of Songs, chapter seven, there. He says, I will now, I said, verse eight, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. Let now your breasts be like clusters of the vine. That's like, what? Well, what's going on? And I just, in the early days, just looked at this as a miracle of water to wine. And the reason I say water to wine, I know the clusters of the palm tree are dates, but you can't disconnect the palm tree from water, can you? You can't disconnect the palm tree in the biblical narrative from water, water source, because in Exodus 15, a very famous stopping off point in the wilderness journey, when it came out of Egypt across the Red Sea, very early on in the journey, the children of Israel came to a place, didn't they, called Aileen. Remember Aileen? And what was that, Aileen? 12 wells and 70 palm trees. And there's so much in that, isn't there? Just the numbers, 12 and 70. You know, what's that remind you of? 12 and 70. It reminds you of a few things, doesn't it? 12 wells, 12 tribes, um, 70 nations. palm trees, 70 nations. That's right. The number of the nations is 70, isn't it? What about Yeshua? Where's 12 and 70 coming to with Yeshua? Yeshua sent out the 12, didn't he? And Yeshua sent out the 70. Incidentally, just after tabernacles, when 70 bulls are slain on behalf of the nations, Israel slayed 70 bulls, didn't he? On behalf of the 70 nations, because they were the priestly nation. And so 12 and 70, you can see it in Yeshua's ministry. You can see it as Israel and the nations. But the palm tree, appears, doesn't it, in Exodus 15 with all of these wells. So I definitely make the connection with palm trees and water, you know, like oasis is out, you know, that's where they are. And so that's when I first read this. I was like, what's going on? I'll, I will now ascend the palm tree. I'll take hold of its branches. Let now your breasts be like clusters of the vine. So I just saw it as that. It's, the, it's a miracle of water to wine. And then this narrative will carry on then with this talking about the wine and this beautiful wine that he's made here with this miraculous ascending the palm tree and changing dates into grapes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. It just is what it is, what's getting said. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, I think I've said pretty much what's there to be said on that. So we have the breasts like clusters, clusters of the vine. What does clusters of the vine remind you of? You know, in our narrative, in the Torah, clusters of the vine. Remember them massive grapes that were brought back? Clusters, Eshkol, it's the word Eshkol, and that's numbers we see that place don't we where it's called the valley of Eshkol because that's when the, the spies came back from the land and they were carrying on a pole a huge cluster 
of groups, you know, and it's all to do with that. The abundance, isn't it? The promised land. The promised land speaks of the new covenant, doesn't it? The promise of the spirit, you know, the fruitfulness, but really all in the context of the vine, clusters of the vine. He is the vine, isn't he? He sure has said, I am the vine. You are the branches, you know. So let now your breasts be clusters of the vine. I think that's that's enough, I think, for that, isn't it? Yeah, I just brought, need another note from Gil. Something that we have said before about breasts, but I just put highlights this because I like to realize it. By these breasts, I meant the ministers of the gospel who communicate the sincere milk of the way to souls and may be compared to clusters for their numbers when there's plenty of them, which is a great mercy to the church and for their unity, likeness, and agreement in their way, in their ministrations. And in the doctrine they preach, though their gifts may be different. Love that picture of a cluster, yeah. everyone working together, all joining together, all connected to the branch, yeah. the vine, all connected to the roots, you know, yeah. but all bearing fruit, yeah. ministering. And then he says, Oh, the, new, the two testaments, <laughs> the two breasts, the two testaments, full of the milk of the word and comparable to clusters of grapes or dates because of the many excellent doctrines and precious promises in them, which when pressed by hearing, reading, meditation and prayer, yield both delight and nourishment to the souls of men. Hallelujah. You know, and there's more, put that on too. And then he says, the fragrance of your breath, like apples, which is an interesting verse, and the roof, of your mouth, like the best wine. And that's why it just all fits in for me with this narrative of Yeshua in John chapter two, at the wedding of Cana, when he turned the water into wine and then the master of the feast said to me, you've saved the best to last. <laughs> you saved the best. Oh, you got the best out first and then the rubbish at the end, but you brought the best out at last, which is a real picture, isn't it? Of, as Yeshua said at the wedding, didn't he? Okay, and it's not my time. It's not my time, no. But he did oblige, didn't he? And he did do a miracle of turning the water into wine. But that illusion, so it's not my time, is it's not my wedding yet. You know, but his wedding will come, will it? And then it will be the best wine ever, which he will provide. You know. So let's just go over that first bit though. The fragrance of your breath, like apples. And there's some, I don't know, I just have to say it as it is, some in the language, in the, in the Hebrew words, it's just a connection that's irresistible, I find in this. So we'll say it now. The fragrance, anyway, first is, uh, we've mentioned this many times, but, you know, the fragrance of Messiah, isn't it? The fragrance of Messiah, we are meant to be a fragrance of Messiah. But the Messiah himself, in Ephesians 5, going right, back to every time you read it in the Torah, when you read it in Noah, and he made a, a ascending offering, didn't he, when he came off the ark, it was a sweet savour to the Lord. Noah's offering was a sweet savour to the Lord. And we see it loads, don't we, in all the sacrifices, you know, the offerings in Leviticus, that they are sweet savours to the Lord. Well, that's all just always pointing to the one and only Yeshua, because it says, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, walk, verse 2, walk in love, walk in love as Messiah also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. You know, it's just gorgeous, isn't it? A sweet smelling aroma is exactly what Yeshua did by his offering of himself. The sacrificial offering of himself is a sweet smelling aroma. So this is that, you know, the sacrificial life. We, we are living sacrifices. That's that. The fragrance is an allusion to the sacrificial life. That denying yourself, that taking up your cross and following him is a fragrance, you know, of a lifestyle. 
but then it says the fragrance of your breath or nose is the better way of you know, describing it. And that's what it's saying. It's like, well, let me just say what it is. It's in chapter two, Genesis chapter two, verse seven is where we first see this word. And it's clearly nose or nostril. And then we'll read it in a minute. Because the next part says, like apples, 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 tafuna. And we've seen that, and we will see it again. So maybe we'll have to have a little bit more of a delve into the apples at some point. But we've already come across them in the song, haven't we? Chapter two. And she was sustaining me with apples. We'll see it next time, or when it's soon, when it says in chapter eight, I awakened you under the apple tree. And that's. So it's when you start connecting things, you go, what's going on? So we'll have to have a look at that. But that's not the point right now. What is the point right now is that the word for apples, tafunach, comes from the word nafach, nafach, which means to breathe. And that also is in chapter 2, verse 7 of Genesis. So the word translated as breath or nose, is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the word for apples, the root of that word to breathe, is also in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. So let's read Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And Yehovah Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. So that word for nostril, and the root word for apple all appears in that amazing creation narrative of how man came into being. God formed him, didn't he, of the dust and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So is that what's being said here? The fragrance of your breath like apples? You know, he's commending it on a fruitfulness. He's ascending the palm tree, changing the fruits of the palm tree into the fruits of the vine. And now the outcome of this is that your fragrance is life-giving. It brings life, just the way God first breathed life into a lifeless dust man and became a living soul. That is what this is saying for me. And then it carries on in that same language, talking about the, the effect of this wine. You know, this wine that's he's miraculously made. It's, it's miraculously done, isn't it? You can't chain baits into grapes unless you're the Lord, <laughs> unless you're the creator. Would it be as well? I mean, I don't know if it is, but, you know, would it be the Holy Spirit as yeah. well? Because it says he breathed on them mm -hmm. and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So I wonder if it's someone that's full of the Spirit. Oh, I like that. What you when he's sure after his ascension, his resurrection, I mean, yeah, and yeah, breathed yeah. on, yeah, yeah. breathed all of that. Any, any breath language is going right back to Genesis yeah. chapter 2, when the Creator himself breathed life. And I think that's what this is saying here, yeah? your breath, because of the continuing work he's doing, you know, which is in a great place, but I'm saying there's still room for development, there's yeah. still room for maturity. Come on. Let's grow up. Let's mm -hmm. let's grow up like we read to the Ephesians into the full stature of what we're called to be. And this is the effect of his influence and his miraculous work by his spirit mm -hmm. in her life. That now her fragrance, her nose, you know, the bouquet, mm -hmm. is like apples. Well, apples in this context are very connected with life-giving. She's a life given up. And that's what's getting said in the next part of it. And the roof of your mouth, like the best wine. So that's carrying on in the same language, really. The roof of your mouth, like the best wine. I'll just stop here and just say this is where it does start to get complex a bit. But it's have to process it ourselves. But um in my translation, I'm in the New King James, and this is a completely new verse, verse 9, and the roof of your mouth like the best wine. The commentators differ. Some of them say, oh, no, this is not the beloved speaking now. 
this is the shooter like bursting in and joining in the chorus. And I'm like, oh. and we make a good case for it. I've left it in red. I've left it as the beloved's carrying on in his sentence to me. But do you make a good case to say? Uh, one of the more profound commentators, uh, Dale Leach, says, the dramatic structure of the song becomes here more strongly manifest than elsewhere before. Shulamite interrupts the king and continues his words as if, as if echoing them, but again breaks off. <laughs> the text as it stands before us requires an interchange of the speakers and nothing prevents the supposition of such an interchange. That, you know, I'm glad I'm reading these things in a way that myself, but I've left it in red. I think it's still the beloved saying this, but she, if they are going, no, oh, she's saying it to him now. The roof of your mouth is like the best wine. But the point being, anyway, the roof of your mouth, what's that mean? The roof of your mouth is, we've looked at this already in the song, this word, when we were in chapter two, verse three. And at that day, it was translated as, taste this word hech, 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 is translated as taste so the taste of your mouth that sounds better than roof is it the taste of your mouth is like the best line but it doesn't even say your mouth to be honest with you probably justified to say we're talking about the taste of a mouth here but it's not what it says it just says the taste the taste your taste is like the best why? Um, I've got a couple of references that I'm going to read. So, just to emphasize that that's what's being said here is taste. Job chapter 34, verse 3. I'll put that one down. Yeah, Job chapter 34, verse 2. Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who have knowledge. For the ear, tests words and the palate tastes food so you can see that's the word taste your taste is like the best wine and then psalm 119 119 verse 103 bring it out a bit more psalm 119 verse 103 how sweet are your words how sweet are your words to my taste sweeter than honey to my mouth. So any reference to how good her taste is is only a reflection of how good his taste is, isn't it? Because we have tasted, you know, we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. So we're able to tell of his army that he's good. And that's our testimony, isn't it? You know, that's what I tell people on the streets when they want to, you're a bit nervous. I say, just tell about, tell people about Jesus. Just say how, why you love Jesus. Just tell everyone in town why you love Jesus? It's like, you should be able to answer that, shouldn't you? <laughs> you should be able to get, get, that should get you going at least. And that's it. If we have tasted of his goodness, then we should have that taste of ours. Should we? we should taste like him. If he is good, we should taste like him. So the taste of your mouth is like the best wine. Taste comes from the word Hanach, Hanach, you know, you've heard that word, Hanukkah, you've heard of Hanukkah, haven't you? It's the feast of dedication. And that's what this word comes from, your taste is coming from the root word Hanach, which means, you know, like Enoch, the fella, Enoch, is his name, and his name mean, meant to be dedicated. And Hanukkah, the feast of dedication, so it's that, it's taste. It's connected with someone who's dedicated, and it's also used in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, a famous one, train a child in the way he should go. Train, train, dedicate, train up. And that's the word here. So anything to do with this tasting is because it's someone who's dedicated and trained up, you know, sort of thing. Uh, and again, I'm just going to quote from Gil, and I'm going to start getting ready to finish off, to be honest with you. We'll carry on next week with this wine going down smoothly, etc. But we'll finish off now with this. So a couple of statements here. This is Gil, as I say, would be favourite. John Gill. Her breath, sweet and of a good smell, like the best wine. The breathings of her soul in prayer, which are sweet odours. 
perfumed with the incense of Christ's meditation. Her speech, the words of her mouth, the root of the mouth being an instrument of speech, which is warm, refreshing, comforting, quickening, and in prayer and praise, which is well-pleasing and delightful to Christ, and especially the gospel preached by her ministers, comparable to the best wine for its antiquity, being an ancient gospel, for its purity, unadulterated and free from mixture, and as faithfully dispensed, its delight, flavour and taste to such who have their spiritual senses exercised and for cheering, refreshing and strengthening nature to drooping weary souls. You know, this is, and that's why it leads into the next verse. We'll just read it when she says, well, when she says, you know, depending on which commentator you're going with, I've got it in the New King James. It's the Shulamite speaking now. She takes over now and she says, the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. We might as well cover that first and then stop there because verse 10 does go off into a very like uh, my beloved sleep, so on. So we'll just finish off with that verse now. The wine, so this beautiful best wine that's being miraculously created by the beloved going up the pantry, doing this change, changing things around. Because of this, the wine goes down smoothly. Or in Hebrew, yasha comes from the word yasha. That's a famous word, yasha. I think we've already read it in Psalm 92. The Lord is upright. Yasha is the Hebrew word. So the wine goes down smoothly or goes straight down, <laughs> you know, straight. Yasha is upright. Mm -hmm. So the wine goes down rightly or smoothly, man says, or sweetly, the New King James says. For my beloved, moving gently or causing to speak the lips of sleepers. And that really says it all, doesn't it? What this effect is of this wine. You know, it's it's the best wine. It's the new wine of the new covenant. And it causes the lips of sleepers to move. You can see the picture, can't you? Someone who's asleep just starting to be awakened. The lips starting to tremble, quiver, move. That's what's being said. And um, yeah, a couple of scriptures on that. Let's just point to the Messiah's ministry of how he does this. You know, he's able to do these things, isn't he? He's able with his wine, with the wine of the gospel, the wine of the new covenants. It's able to awaken sleepers. And you can see sleepers in two contexts. You can see them as sins, people who are dead in their trespasses and sins, asleep in that way being wakened up to righteousness. But you can also, and mainly see it, as it's put by most, the drowsy, lifeless, <laughs> gone back to sleep believers who were aroused and quickened again, brought out of their refuge and are ready to acknowledge their backslidings, to speak meanly and modestly of themselves and very highly of Christ and his grace, who has healed their backslidings and still loves them freely, none more ready to exalt and magnify Christ and speak in praise of what he has done for them. So that's just a little bit from the thing he uh, commentators. But a couple of scriptures to finish off. Isaiah 35, and then the Gospels, where we can see it in action, and then just a couple of scriptures from Paul to summarise all of that. So Isaiah... Well, it's been in Isaiah 35 tonight, talking about Carmel. Well, this is Isaiah 35, verse 6. It's a great passage, you know, but, you know, going back to verse 5. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. This is Isaiah 35, an amazing messianic kingdom passage, which we get a glimpse into. In Yeshua's first coming, and it's only going to get better at a second coming, I'd say. But Mark chapter 7, 
is where you see that actually happen. Proving he's the Messiah, demonstrating, doing these works to show you who he is. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Again, depart from the region of Tyre and Sidon, who came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. So we'll just see it in Isaiah 35, didn't we? that the deaf will hear and the dumb will sing. And so they brought someone who was both deaf and dumb, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears and spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Eph, father, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly, hallelujah. And that is the Lord doing exactly what Isaiah 35 said. Death was here, the dumb would speak. And that's what this is, this why causes the lips of those who are asleep. Lips that haven't spoken for years, good things can now start to speak again because of the effect of this believer and the why that he has produced in here, they have to say it like that, yeah? And then finally, um, two scriptures from Paul, which just say exactly this. Romans 13, and then that's it, we've got an hour, and that's 17 to an hour, isn't it? So, and I'm glad to just keep going on this again. I want to continue, finish off this song, and then soon get to the much anticipated study into how the Sabbath was changed to the Sunday. And that's coming up in a few weeks once we finish this song. So let's get to it. Romans 13, great words, verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The, light, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Yeshua the Messiah and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil its lusts. That was Romans 13 in the context of it's time to awake out of sleep. And how many of us need to hear this? Really? And how many of us need to hear this? It's time to awake out of sleep. Our salvation is near. Our salvation is so close. We saw as he read about the crowns that are there for those who really love his appearing, for those who aren't ashamed of his second coming, for those who aren't ashamed to be in love with him and his coming again. Let's wake and rise out of slumber. And we all need to encourage each other with this. No matter how good you think you do, mm -hmm. you know, you know what, you know how things can go. So let's stay awake. Mm -hmm. And finally, on that is Ephesians chapter five. And this is the final scripture, Ephesians chapter five, verse 14. Therefore, no, if you want to understand what the therefore is, therefore, go back and read the rest of it. It's strong words, but therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. You know, a great wise and foolish virgin narrative, isn't it? A real great way to discern, distinguish between the wise and the foolish. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another. And this is something we try to do practically, isn't it? Oh, oh let's do that. Well, do it. <laughs> when it says speak to each other in the sounds, you can't do it without tearing to the sounds and getting them out. And it works, doesn't it? You know, we just discipline yourselves as a group to go, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Do it. The sounds are amazing, aren't they? You know, we love them in this group, don't we? The sounds are part of us. We wouldn't be the same fellowship without the sounds. 
So speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So that's the final word on it tonight. But that's what this wine that he makes, and when we party and share it, it will have this effect. It will move, awaken the lips of sleepers, you know, both people that need to come into the faith and people that are in the faith but have gone back to sleep again. Don't never forget all of the ten virgins, the wise and the foolish. Matthew 25 says they all were asleep. They all were asleep. So we can all admit to this that there's been sleepiness. But it's time to awake, as Romans and Ephesians says. Now's the time to awake. Don't put it off. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. You know, if this is speaking to anyone listening, then please submit to it and awake and drink the new wine fully. Plenty of it to go down. So thank you, Father. Again, thank you for our Saviour. Thank you for our Lord, for Yeshua, for the bridegroom himself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you did, Lord. You came, you obeyed the Father, out of love for the Father, and out of love for us, for the joy set before you. Joy and wine are connected, aren't they? For the joy set before you, you endured the cross. Help us to follow you, Lord, in the same way, with the same joy, with the same endurance, with the same prize before us, Lord, and crowns we have spoken of tonight. Help us in all of this, Lord, to love your appeal. Help this to have the effect on us, Lord. I only ask, I only ask in Yeshua's name, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've sent, given to us to help us, to equip us. Thank you for the work you're doing in us, Lord. Give you praise. Thank you for our salvation tonight. Amen. 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 Well, we'll leave it there then. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll carry on hopefully next week. But, you know, we'll carry on soon. I'll finish this song of songs. See you again.